My name is Esther Tovstiadi, and I am the Electronic Resources Librarian at the University of Colorado Boulder. And on behalf of the NASIG Continuing Education Committee, I'd like to welcome you to our April webinar, Planning for the Budget Ocalypse, the Evolution of a Serials ER Cancellation Methodology, presented by Todd Enoch and Karen Harker, who are joining us today from Denton, Texas. By the end of today's webinar, I think we'll all feel a little more empowered to deal with our next serials cancellation project. And we'll even learn why the word apocalypse has more to do with data analysis than you may think. Before we get started, I have a few quick announcements. First, this webinar will be recorded and anyone who registered will receive a link to the recording via email following the webinar. Additionally, We'll make a copy of the question and answer portion of the webinar and the PowerPoint slides available afterwards. Second, if you have any questions for Todd and Karen during the presentation, please enter them into the WebEx Q&A box located at the lower right corner of the WebEx window. If you can't see the Q&A box, look in the upper right corner of the WebEx window and click on the Q&A icon. The box should appear below in the lower right corner. Todd and Karen will answer your questions at the end of their presentation. And finally, when the webinar is over, you will be redirected to a survey about it. I hope that you will take a few minutes to share your opinion and help us improve our future webinars. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Todd Enoch, obtained his MLS from the University of North Texas while working in their library as a staff member, first in cataloging and later in serials. He is currently the head of serials and electronic resources for the UNC libraries in Denton, Texas. Karen Harker received an MLS from Texas Women's University in 1999 while she was a librarian at UT Southwestern. She then received an MPH from the UT School of Public Health in 2007. During her two years as collection assessment librarian at UNT Libraries, Karen has developed methods for regularly collecting data about the library's resources that can be used as needed for routine and not so routine budget modifications, as well as ad hoc resource evaluations. Prior to joining UNT Libraries, Karen was a biostatistician for a clinical trial at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School at Dallas. And with that, I will turn things over to our presenters. Thank you, Esther. Uh, thank you all for uh, attending today. Uh, before we get started, a quick note of attribution. The phrase budget ocalypse was coined by Kim Stanton, our media librarian, popularized by Cyan Brandon, our Associ assistant dean of collection management, and then appropriated by Karen and myself for, the, for this presentation. So with that, we will get started. Uh, as Esther mentioned, Karen and I uh, work for the University of North Texas in Denton, Texas, which is just north, about equidistant from Dallas and Fort Worth. We're a state-funded public university with an enrollment of about 36,000, with our FTEs being closer to 28,000. And that number is really, really important to us at the UNT libraries because of how we're budgeted. Uh, the UNT library's budget is almost exclusively provided by a student use fee. Uh, that covers not just our materials budget, but also all of our expenses, salaries, travel, equipment, etc. All of that comes from the student use fee. Uh, having student use fee budget can have some advantages. That's money that's dedicated specifically for us that can't be scooped up by anyone else. but it also has some limits. So one limit for this particular use fee is that it's a capped per credit hour fee. So that, for example, if a student takes more than the cap, which is around 12 to 14 hours, then we don't get any money for the additional hours that they're taking. And that can add up over a while. The other big limit is that our budget rises and falls with enrollment to the degree that in 2010, when our enrollment began to plateau, 
then our budget began to plateau. And so flat enrollment equals a flat budget, which equals cuts in a cereals world due to inflation. So in 2011, we began our first round of budget cuts. Um, at that point in time, our materials budget was approximately $8 million, and we were approached by administration and told to do target cuts of around three quarters of a million. Uh, it had to be done very quickly, so we sprung into action and did the most basic cuts that we could think of. Uh, we deactivated all of our YBP approval plans. We still received slips. Uh, to help in selection, but we didn't have anything shipped directly to us without us placing an order. Uh, we also did an across-the-board 71% reduction of our firm money allocations. Uh, we tried to spread the pain as ev evenly as possible across all of our departments. And finally, we did a massive e-conversion project. We tried to convert anything that could be moved from print or print plus online to online only as we could partially for the savings that could come for the online-only subscriptions that are cheaper, but also because at that time our bindery is part of our materials budget. So by reducing the amount of print materials we received, we also reduced the amount of money we would need to spend on processing and binding. Now the pros and cons of this first round of cuts, the pros is that it was just really simple to implement. All we had to do was make the decision of how much we were going to budget, and then let people know they weren't going to have as much to spend that year. The e-conversions was a little bit more involved, but nothing that we weren't already doing. The biggest con is that it was just a stopgap measure. We could only do a 71% reduction to our firm order budget once to have it make any impact at all. After that, there wasn't much more blood you could squeeze out of that stone. So we knew that moving forward, any of our major cuts were going to need to come from our serials budget. Which brings us to 2012. In early 2012, we were told we were going to need to make a $1 million cut to our serials budget. Uh, so we met and began to talk about what our criteria for consideration was going to be. Now these criteria were not things that were automatically canceled. These were things that were going to be up for consideration. If they met this criteria, we would note them as things that we would recommend for cancellation before getting more feedback from our other stakeholders. These criteria include duplication across resources. Uh, if we had something uh, in a subscription to full text, but we also had access to the current full text in an aggregator, we'd mark the subscription as possible cancellation. Uh, things that had restricted access. We didn't have a lot of these, but we did have several uh, business databases that were restricted to only a certain user set. For example, only doctoral students or master students who needed access to this for particular assignments and could get limited access. So we decided with the limited amount of money that we were going to have, we didn't want to spend it on things that couldn't be utilized by our entire user base. Uh, next we looked at usage, both uh, internal usage, circulation stats, as well as online stats. So if it had low usage, it was up for consideration. If it had a high cost per use, it was up for consideration. And finally, we looked at embargoes. Anything that was available in an aggregator and had a, an embargo of less than one year was up for consideration. And then anything with an embargo of one year but cost more than $2,000 was also up for consideration. So once we got all those criteria mapped out, it was time for us to start gathering data. And this was probably the most time consuming part of the entire process for us, because at this point in time, we had not regularly been collecting any sort of usage data. So we spent a lot of time trying to set up admin accounts, verify passwords, see if we could even get usage for our online items, and then trying to pull usage circulation data for our print material was difficult. And we also had to try and find overlap for and embargoes for aggregators. So there was just a lot of data that we were just trying to gather together to even figure out what titles met the criteria we had selected. But once we had done that, we then met with our subject liaisons. We met individually with each liaison, and we were provided them with spreadsheets that listed all of the titles paid for for their particular discipline. 
So the English department had a periodical fund, and so they were provided with a spreadsheet that listed all of the materials paid for out of that particular fund. Not things that were related to English, just things that they had paid for. And we asked them to rank each title on a scale of one to three. One was a must have, two was a nice to have, and three was something that can go. And then we asked them to consult with their faculty to get feedback on this ranking. And we allowed for them one month to consult with their faculty and get back to us with their uh, spreadsheets. Uh, once we got that data back, we started trying to compile our million dollar cut. Anything that was marked as can go went. And unfortunately, that did not get us to a million dollars. So we then began looking at the things that were marked as nice to have and seeing which one of those actually met our criteria of consideration and started moving those to our cut list until we reached a million dollars. Once we reached that point, we went to our administration to get their okay, and they said, great job, but can you give us another quarter million? So we went back to the drawing board, went back to those twos, uh, dug deeper into those nice to have until we finally reached 1.25 million. At that point, we got the okay to share the list of cuts to our liaisons and our faculty. Uh, we provided a master cut list to them that included everything that was up for consideration so that, for example, the liaison could go, oh, this is being paid for out of this other fund, but it's really important to my department. Can we maybe try and keep it? And so we could have maybe some negotiations to keep a few things. And once that was all said and done, we were finally able to get a finalized list about six months after we had started the process. Now, the pros and cons of this uh, method, the pros is we began to see the value of data and knew that if we were going to have to do more cuts, we were really going to have to step up our game of collecting data and having it ready for whenever these questions arose. And that also allowed for more liaison faculty feedback than our previous methods had. The cons is the liaisons were overwhelmed with information. Giving them a list of every title that was subscribed to by their departments gave them a lot of things they had to go through and try and rank, especially those liaisons who had three or four subjects they had to wrangle. And then when we provided them with the master list, there were just so many titles listed that a few things slipped the cracks because they didn't realize it was listed in our spreadsheet by the full title was cataloged under instead of the title they were familiar with it by. So we had to reinstate a few things later on because no one realized we had canceled PNAS because it was under the full title. Um, another con was ranking issues. Uh, First of all, we had trouble getting some people to rank enough things as twos or threes mm -hmm. and had to go back to them to say, not everything is a must have. <laughs> but we also had issues with some liaisons who had their own internal uh, ways of ranking items and then input those onto the spreadsheet. And so we had to convert them into the one, two, or three. And most of those weren't problems except for the one that was mainly color coding <laughs> and like six different methods. And it was kind of hard to get back into our regular scheme. So it taught us to lock those cells down in future times. And finally, there just was not enough time or data for an in-depth analysis that we really wanted to do. We were spending so much time just gathering data. We weren't even able to gather all the data we wanted in the time frame that we had. So we knew moving forward we wanted to spend more time and have more data to to help us make our decisions. Now in 2013, we were fortunate enough to get a one-time infusion of money so we didn't have to do any cuts that year. So we could start trying to gather our data and marshal our forces for 2014. So 2014, our third round of cuts. The initial target was 1.25 million and this was kind of a worst case scenario that they gave us. They told us that it probably wouldn't be that bad, but we wanted to aim for the worst case scenario and then be able to walk it back rather than aim for a million and then have to go back and ask for more cuts. Uh, we also decided to focus only on subscriptions that cost $1,000 or more. Uh, partially this was to cut down on the number of titles that we had to analyze and that other people, the liaisons and faculty had to to look at and analyze, but also it was just because we knew things that cost less than that weren't going to make a lot of a dent if we did cancel them. So that's kind of what we put our focus on. We also had enough time this time around to actually look at our big deals. 
In the 2012 run of cuts, we did not even touch the big deals, did no real analysis of them because we didn't have the time and staff and energy. But this time around, we were able to look at the majority of our big deals, those that weren't under extended contracts. There were a couple that we couldn't look at until this year, but anything that was able to be looked at, we were going to look at. And while we were doing our planning for the third round of cuts, we discovered this article using a decision grid process to build consensus in electronic resources cancellation decisions by Fowdy and McManus. And this article really gave us some good ideas and, used it, and we used it as a springboard to help us in our actual analysis of the resources. And with that, I will turn it over to our analysis guru, Karen, to talk about all the data that she crunched. Thank you, Todd, for giving that good background. Yes, I joined in the UNT in uh, January 2012. Uh, so I was a participant in the um, um, round two, and it, it was kind of hairy, but it did reveal a lot of uh, areas we could improve on. Um, it was interesting the use of the word apocalypse because the Greek word of apocalypse means the uncovering or the lifting of veil, which I thought was rather apt uh, given that what we did because the data we gathered revealed some unexpected results. <clears throat> um, while thinking about the kinds of data to collect, we of course considered the usual suspects, cost, use, and cost per use. But the Decision Grid article enlightened us on casting a wider net of data, such as using the average, average of three years of uses, um, incorporating subjective opinions of, uh, of, of content and, and ease of use, as well as sustainability in the form of an inflation factor. And while we consider uniqueness to the curriculum in a subjective manner, we also wanted to look at overlap using a more objective manner. And we also wanted to use measures that were common to most, uh, if not all, of our resources. Um, overlap uh, is, uh, I'll discuss later, usage, various ways of looking at usage, in the inflation factor, and the librarian's input. Overlap analyses were conducted for only selected types of resources, of course, um, notably e-journals and the A&I databases. Uh, we used a variety of resources, uh, of sources of data depending on the type of resource. a &I databases, uh, we use JISC. JISC is out of uh, UK, but it provides a nice little tool. So does CUFS. They're, they're, uh, the databases that they look at only slightly overlap. And then we also did manual comparisons where we um, uh, downloaded title lists and into a database and then uh, ran comparisons. We did paired comparisons only. We didn't uh, try and compare one database against three, four, or more databases, just one database compared against another. Um, for individual journal subscriptions, we also looked at the embargo period and the source of the full text, if available elsewhere. Learning from Fowdy and McManus, we calculated the average of the last three years of usage, if available. We knew that different resources provided different measures. Um, so rather than trying to use one common measure, like the lowest common denominator, like sessions, um, just we decided to use the highest and best measure of use available. Some such measures would be closest to the final outcome of an individual user's session. And uh, we took this kind of measure into consideration when we did compare the resources head to head. By highest and best use measure, um, again, it depends, usually depends on the resource. Uh, full text downloads was provided by most e-journals and packages of e-journals 
as well as the full text databases and to some extent some of the re reference sources, usually the ones that are like reference books. Abstract and record views um, were provided mostly by the ANI databases that have um, uh, upgraded to counter uh, revision four, which I do applaud their inclusion of um, record views. Searches was the best measure available for those databases and reference sources that hadn't yet upgraded to uh, counter three. And then there's all those uh, non-counter compliant resources where usually the best thing they give us is sessions. And that's questionable. The inflation factor was something mentioned in that article that we in that article that we had not really taken into account. Um, we decided to go ahead and use the last five years of um, expenditures. Todd had to download all the expenditures data from our ILS, which was Triple I Sierra. Uh, but this took a lot of massaging of the data, and we were finally able to summarize the expenditures for each resource across the five years and calculate an average annual percentage change. Uh, surprisingly, this ranged from well below zero to nearly 100%. Um, now we, success, now we suspected that the rate of change was dependent, at least in part, on the type of resource, e-journals being more, um, perhaps, and then databases. So we looked at the distribution of these rates of change by the type of resource. And here's a graphic representation of that, those distributions, each column being a type of resource. Um, and I used conditional formatting to make the pretty colors um, to show the range from the lowest 10th percentile in green to the highest 90, 90th percentile in red. This is just to give you an idea. Uh, here's a nice table of the distribution of average percentage changes over the last five years by resource type. Uh, interestingly, while the re extremes vary wildly by type from 24% decrease to 92% oh, uh, increase, the rates in the middle are pretty consistent with a median rate of change of about 4.5%. Uh, however, when examining individual resources, we wanted to know where their change in expenditures fell relative to others of similar resources. Uh, by the way, that 92% increase was artifactual due to a change in publisher, which we took into consideration, of course. Um, gathering the subjective opinions of our liaisons was a little tricky, um, as Todd uh, referenced in our earlier attempt. Um, so this time, we decided to follow pretty much the format uh, that Saudi and McManus wrote about. Uh, we used a three-by-three three rubric uh, where the liaisons rated each resource on three criteria uh, at three levels, with lowest score being the best. They evaluated the resources that were specific to their discipline, as well as a group of interdisciplinary resources that were at least uh, somewhat relevant. Interestingly, this turned into a good teaching moment whereby liaisons seriously considered resources they had not even really knew about. Finally, there was the opportunity for the liaisons to provide qualitative input using a free, note, free text notes field, which was heavily used in the final analysis. Um, so thinking about um, two specific types of resources, we had to go in, I want to go into a little more of what we did with those, big deals and databases and reference. The big deals, um, we knew that given the progressive decline of our materials budget, as Todd explained, uh, we knew that the journal packages and big deals uh, were going to need serious evaluation. Of course, we used the usual suspects, cost, cost per title, cost per use, et cetera. But we also look at the overlap of their coverage, as well as the distribution of usage across the titles. 
and the cost of each title individually, if we had gotten individual subscriptions, and um, as well as alternative models of obtaining the content uh, that we needed. For overlap of full text, we used the um, eJournals management service, uh, which we use Serial Solutions. Uh, most um, eJournal management systems provide some kind of overlap analysis. Um, and so Serial Solutions we, is the one we used. Um, we then exported the list of titles um, and overlap for all titles, as well as um, the type of overlap, the source of the overlap. And here is an example of one package, the overlap of one package, and um, we highlighted the sources of overlap that were, we considered relatively safe. We were not going to be getting rid of these uh, sources. Um, and of course, the more overlap in those safe sources, the more questionable that package is. We also looked at the distribution of usage across all titles in a package. Um, although I had been studying distributions of data in LIS research, including circulations, downloads, titles, et cetera, I became aware of the value of using this, using this in the assessment of big deals uh, by this article by Scherpfel and LeDuc. Looking at the distributions across the titles helps answer the question of how useful this package as a set is to our users. So I'm sure most of you have heard of the 80-20 uh, rule, right? You know, that is 80% of book circulations are from only 20% of the titles. Uh, well, we could use that same benchmark uh, for evaluation of journal packages. 80% of uses are served by what percentage of titles? It's actually quite easy to do once we had the average of the uh, three years usage. We then sorted the titles highest to lowest by usage, then calculated the cumulative percentage of uses going down the list, and then also the cumulative percent of titles. Then looking at the 80th percentile of uses, we looked at then the cumulative percentage of titles, and I, this will make sense in a second. A higher percentage of titles indicates a wider spread of usage across the titles in the package. A lower uh, number indicates a greater concentration of usage across a few titles. So here's an example from our annual review package. And at the top, you can see that it's uh, sorted um, uh, from highest to lowest by uh, three-year average usage. And then we calculated uh, the cumulative percentage of uses and the cumulative percentage of titles. Um, and then we found that 80%, um, 79.8% of the usage is across 44.7, nearly 45% of our titles. That's actually pretty good. Um, so this package, as a set of titles, is actually uh, quite efficient. <clears throat> we wanted to look at alternative models of getting methods of getting the content, notably through subscriptions to individual journals, pay-per-view, and the copyright clearance centers get it now. Uh, we compared the theoretical cost per use if we had uh, gotten this title through an individual subscription um, or even from the Get It Now um, or um, the pay-per-view and compare that with the actual package cost per use. <coughs> There are other ways of getting the uh, content, the articles, um, including the pay-per-view and the uh, Get It Now, uh, but, but they both cost about $30 an article, give or take. 
Of course, not all publishers do this, but enough do it to make it feasible for us to consider. So when it was apparent that a package was not particularly effective or efficient, we considered alternative scenarios to answer this question. What would we do if we had to drop it, the package? Generally, these scenarios were developed based on a combination of subscribing to the most highly effective titles, in, uh, using alternative sources for the middle of the road titles, and ILL, all the rest. So that's how we did packages. Uh, so thinking about databases, though, and reference sources, um, these were also a little different. Um, we looked at the usual suspects again, um, but we also looked at overlap of indexing primarily, as well as open URL linking uh, for the full text, the percentage of links going in to that resources. And for A&I databases, the percentage of links linking out from the index to the full text. <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, it, um, no, not as I mentioned earlier. This was actually for earlier in the uh, actual uh, conference. Uh, I did do a presentation on doing overlap, um, which was not made into a webinar, but I think the slides are available on the NASIC site. Um, so I, having to cram a 45-minute uh, presentation into uh, 30 seconds in one slide. We used a combination of sources to determine overlap, mainly by downloading journal lists into a database and running queries. These were all matched at the title level by ISSN, so it's not perfect, but it did give us a general idea. Uh, like the full text overlap, we only did pair, paired comparisons and we noted the highest overlap rate and the database against which that target was compared. Um, so as you can see, this took a lot, a lot of different kinds of data and all compiling them into one source, enabling us to compare the apples with the oranges fairly um, well, fairly effectively. The three basic criteria in the final analysis was cost per use, liaison scores, and inflation factor. We wanted to penalize resources that did not provide usage data or for which the liaisons just flat out would not provide scores. And we, and we gave the, P, the liaisons a lot of chances to do that, by the way. And we weighted the sum of the liaison scores to show greatest importance to uniqueness to the curriculum and greater importance to breadth. But these were all on different scales. How could we uh, use a single scale? Well, we decided to use the distribution of each resources score in each of these categories, criteria, um, as percentiles. These are relative to each resource type. So all the data for da databases was analyzed separately from the data for um, e-journals and the data for packages. And then uh, uh, for some of the, these data, we reversed the direction so that for all the scores, the highest percentile was the best. This enabled us to use zero for the missing data. The composite score is the average of the percentiles for all three criteria. So this is, um, Again, the emphasis is on percentiles because this allows us to view how each resource fell relative to others of its same type. And here's an example of uh, some resources that and their scores. And these are uh, color-coded uh, to show red being the uh, low worst 
10th percentile and green being the highest, best 10th percentile, 90th percentile. And uh, as you can see, there's three columns plus a composite. Now, we often found that the, uh, when it came to actual application of this, the inflation score was often used as the third or tie-breaking factor uh, if, it, if there was something questionable. So for the final analysis, we had a master list with all um, of the resources that we were evaluating, all of those greater than $1,000 with the overall evaluation and sorted by percentile rank for each uh, criteria. And then um, actions were decided, uh, were viewed by fund uh, to ensure that the distribution of pain was relatively equitable. In addition, notes were um, added, the qualitative notes uh, were added for in the master list. The uh, Collection Development Librarian and the Collection Development Liaison Librarian reviewed the data and made decisions based on modestly objective review of the data. The default status for all items started out with on the table. Well, because, well, everything was on the table. In order to ensure that the changes were distributed fairly across the di disciplines, uh, we used a pivot table of the actions by fund and here you can see that there were some uh, funds that had nothing changed and some that had everything dropped. And so we, they, uh, the collection development librarian went back in and made some adjustments um, to make sure the pain was more equitable. And that is all about the data, and I return now to Todd. Thank you, Karen. So once all the numbers have been crunched and the decisions have been made based on that, our plan was to provide a master list to liaisons for their review, allow time for faculty feedback, and incorporate suggested swap outs. That was the plan, mm -hmm. uh, but reality intruded. Uh, due to some higher level university budget issues, we were not able to get our list out to the faculty before they left for the summer. Uh, which led to us being really rushed because we had to have our decisions into our subscription agents basically within a week of the faculty returning. Uh, so that led to a lot of last minute decisions, last minute swap outs, and a lot of stress, uh, especially a, a lot of disgruntled faculty who felt they weren't given enough time to adequately look at, at the data. But, uh, those were circumstances beyond our control, and we just had to roll with it as best as we could. But once all is said and done for this round of cuts, uh, we maintained around 1,800 subscriptions. Uh, we canceled or modified 533. And the modifies were things like the package deals where we decided to break them up and only keep certain titles or a few things where we decided to maybe take down the seat limit or things like that. Uh, all told by the end, we had about $976,000 in serials cost savings. And we wound up doing some other sort of things to kind of get up to around a million dollars in cuts overall. But that was basically our third round of cuts. Uh, the pros and cons. The pros, it combined objective and subjective data together into a composite score that facilitated a sorting and ranking. It became so much easier, especially with the conditional formatting, to be able to just sort by that composite score and scroll down until the numbers went from green to yellow to red to kind of give us an idea of where the problem areas were that we would need to start looking at for where to start our cut. Uh, as Karen mentioned, it compared our resources by type, so we made sure that journals weren't being unfairly compared to databases or reference works or anything else, just their type. And so we can make sure that our analysis was more equitable. And we had feedback from multiple sources. 
The cons, it was time and labor intensive. Uh, not just the amount of data we had to gather, but by having to compare each resource by its type, that took a lot more time than just comparing them all against each other. The overlap analysis was a lot of work because a lot of it had to be done manually and so it was a lot of time and energy spent into this. And we were still gathering usage data even at the end. We were still trying to make sure that everything is giving us the usage data that we need. And as you can probably tell, it was a pretty complex system. And we were basically learning as we were going to. So there were lots of changes and lots of stumbles along the way as we were trying to figure out the best way to handle it. But in the end, we were very happy with the way it turned out so that when we reach 2015 and our current round of cuts, which are currently ongoing, we're keeping that same basic methodology of evaluation. Um, we're just going to, we decided to keep the liaison scores from the previous year, decided that there wasn't going to be enough of a difference between last year and this year to warrant going out and resurveying them. We just have updated the, the cost per use information. Um, and we made one other change in how we're approaching this, though, in that we've asked, instead of be, being given a cut amount from administration, we've actually asked for just a basic budget amount that we're going to be allowed. So they have given us an amount of about $5.6 for this year, and so we're building our budget from the ground up. We're just going to go, okay, this is how much we want to spend on this, this is how much you want to spend on this, and we'll just keep adding things to it until we actually reach uh, the amount that we're allowed to spend. And the, it serves as a much more positive method, but it's also trying to come up with an uh, amount of cuts is difficult when you are dealing with projected pricing and inflationary pricing that's not really a real thing anyway. So we can project, oh, this is going to save us a million dollars, but then the things that we cut may not have inflated quite that much anyway. Uh, but we decided that going for a more positive building from the ground up would just make much more sense for us in a planning process. Uh, more, there are more resources that are meeting that $1,000 threshold this time around. Part of that is things that were just under the threshold before having increased in price enough to cross it. But also, we broke up uh, four or five big deals uh, last time and have individual subscriptions now. So we have a lot more individual subscriptions that were hiding in the big deal overall cost before. So even though we got rid of a lot of subscriptions, we added a lot of individual titles that need to be uh, treated as individuals now and not as part of an overall package. Now, there were things that we didn't review, things that had been very obvious keeps in the last round, things that had really substantially high usage or substantially low cost per use, we knew were not going to have a sudden dip this year, or we hoped. But with the trend of over several years worth of data that the things were highly efficient and highly effective, we were just going to felt safe just marking them as keep for this year. We will revisit them later. Uh, the other thing we did not review were what we call our endangered species uh, titles. Now, during the, the swap out period, we allowed faculty and liaisons to say, hey, this title is really important to us. Can we keep this but get rid of something else, even though the usage shows us really, really poor? And in most cases, we would say yes if we were able to find a sufficient thing to swap out that also didn't need, that didn't show really great use, but we told them that they would need to work on promoting this resource and bringing its usage up. So we have this endangered species list of things that we allowed them to keep for now, but they are fully aware that if come next year their usage has not gone up or the cost per use has not gone down significantly, then it's probably going to, to go away. And because we gave them this endangered species list just partway through last year. This year is not enough time for any efforts they might have done to promote usage to have taken effect. So those are safe for now, and but come next year when we'll probably have to do another round of cuts, uh, those are going to be at the top of our list. So kind of in conclusion, our methods have changed uh, several times over the years, but the 
the methodology that we came up with in 2014, we feel really confident in and comfortable with, and we hope to continue to use that method moving forward. And we'll have some tweaks here and there we're sure, but overall, the uh, the percentile ranking and composite score seems to be the best for our, our purposes. So here are our many, many references, and now it's time for questions. So Esther, do you have any questions for us? Yes, Todd and Karen, we have a few. Um, so you mentioned breaking up a number of big deals and adding individual subscriptions. Did adding the individual subscriptions impact staff workload? Um, and there's an initial uh, impact, yes, because we had to go ahead and create individual order records for them. And as we do our big renewals this year, we're going to have to evaluate those. And there will be a little bit of an individual uh, title uh, workload impact probably. We also had to go in and do some work to, in our, in Serial Solutions, deselecting titles and selecting new titles and making sure that we kept track of our archival rights and what we still had access to and not. So there's some initial work that's been put in, but on the whole, I don't think it's going to be a constant impact. It'll mainly hit us more at renewal times, I believe. Okay, uh, one more question. Um, what kind of qualitative notes did the liaisons share? Um, for example, was there specific feedback that you saw, a trend of feedback from your liaisons? I think it was mostly this, this resource is used uh, by so-and-so faculty in his courses um, or something like that, so, something that explained why this is a must-have even though the usage is poor. Um, and so it was, those were, were usually very useful uh, in terms of, of those Midland group of, of resources that showed, you know, only moderate, um, moderately high um, usage. Uh, we had another question. Um, so is UNT able to acquire any new resources with these continuing cuts? Uh, yes, uh, basically the way that we're approaching it is we're trying to be a lot more nimble in our ordering processes and if someone is requesting something new because it's you know, cutting edge or needed for their field, we don't want to penalize them for it. So we, we do make some allowances for adding new materials, but it is always with the caveat that it could go away soon, or they may have to sacrifice something else to get the new resource. And so we've been focusing a lot more on looking at things like databases that we can do a one-time purchase of, because we have a little bit more flexibility with our firm money. So things that we could purchase access to and then just pay a real small continuing resource fee. We've been exploring those a lot more than we have ongoing resources of journals and databases. But if there is something that someone puts forward, we do a, uh, have, a, have a group in collection development who are assessing these requests and trying to see if these are actually useful. We have kind of a wish list that we maintain so that if we do get an infusion of money at some point in time, we might be able to, to purchase these things. So we are definitely open to purchasing new things, but we uh, are always basically cautioning people that a new purchase might have to come at the expense of some other thing if it carries a large continuing resource cost. Um, we had a question about streaming video. So did you include streaming video in your review? Yes, we actually did. Um, uh, uh, sources like uh, Alexander Street um, and a few others, um, we did include, I, I put them in the group of reference sources because there weren't that many, <laughs> so they couldn't really make their own group. Um, but yes, we did. And we, uh, I think I counted views at, on the same level as full text downloads um, for that.
one question we had. Um, so was anything you found to be a huge surprise or did the data that you collected confirm your and your liaison's suspicions about your e-resource use? I was surprised at how how much varied the usage of packages, the, the efficiency rates. Like I said, annual reviews had a very high uh, efficiency of usage, and then another package had a very low efficiency. It was, you know, like 15% or something like that. Um, so that's one thing I was surprised about. There were a few databases that I was surprised that you know, usage was just so poor, um, and and it was hard to uh, make. Or let me rephrase that. It was hard to convince others that we needed to get rid of it. Um, so. Um, uh, yeah, I would say one of the surprising things is sometimes the the gap between what our data was showing us was being used and what our faculty mm -hmm. were telling us were being used. We had. One package that we broke up where we had a suggested list of titles to keep because the usage showed that these were the most highly used titles. And then the faculty provided us the list of the titles that they thought needed to be kept, and there was almost no overlap between the two. So while our data showed where the titles from this package were actually being used did not match up with the titles the faculty thought were the most important. And granted, they're, they're ideas are probably based more on maybe impact factor or things they want to publish in, but the things that are definitely being used, they didn't list hardly any of those as things that they saw as important. So, and that's a big part of the difficulties that we, we have is trying to communicate these ideas uh, to them that our data is not matching their, their picture of, of reality. And that's probably been the biggest struggle sometimes is, is getting that across. Well, I think that's been the biggest surprise is even though you know you know, that there's going to be a small a small gap between people's perceptions and what the data might show. Sometimes the gap between them was just so vast, it was kind of overwhelming to us. Um, another related question about communicating these cuts. Um, did you discuss this situation um, with your vendors or providers uh, to try to receive more favorable subscription rates? Uh, we have started doing that. A, uh, that has been a big part of, of this year is with our renewals. We have definitely been using the, the cuts as, as our uh, negotiating a, a tool uh, because we basically can't afford some of the, the increases anymore. Um, a lot of people have come back to us, a, uh, things that we cut, they came back to us to say, hey, we saw that you canceled this. You know, would you be able to resubscribe at a lower price? But at that point in time, we basically had to tell them no because we've already, you know, allotted all of our money. And so once it was canceled, even if they came back at a significant decrease, we just didn't have any free money to pay for it. But we have been, you know, with the knowledge that we have undergone a few million dollars in cuts. As I said, our, our, Initial materials budget back in 2011 was around 8 million. We're down to around 5.6 million now. And uh, so every, every the last, over the last four years, you know, we, we've gone down close to, getting close to two and a half million. A, uh, we'll probably go down even more the, the coming year. So yeah, we definitely have, have it put forward whenever we have our renewals. Uh, we've been using that we discussed with the, the vendors, letting them know that we're having a hard time scraping by and any help that they can give us will be greatly appreciated. Um, we had a question about your methodology. Did you factor the size of the department into the usage? Um, for example, did you factor that maybe a smaller department might have lower usage, um, but that the journal might be core to the field? Not really. <laughs> we, uh, because we of these cuts, um, we knew that yes, there's some fields that do have um, uh, fewer people um, involved, and therefore the usage is going to be lower. Um, but we had a bottom a bottom line that we had to meet. Um, so we we didn't look at usage by itself. 
that was not the primary factor. It was the cost per use. Um, so, um, no, we did not take the department size into consideration. But at the same time, uh, with the way that our funding model used to be set up, the smaller departments would also have kind of smaller budgets. And so whenever we looked at the cuts, we were looking at a percentage of their overall budget. So we tried to make sure that every department made uh, the cuts were around the same percentage point, not the same dollar point. Right. And so, so we did kind of take into consideration that in that way, and that the smaller groups didn't have as much money, but then so their percentage of cuts were going to be a smaller dollar amount. So, but there are, there are lots of factors that went into how the old fund structures were set up that really the process was never a truly fair process to begin with. Some subjects have moved so much money from their firm line into their periodical line years ago that they were hurt. They weren't hurt at all by the 71% cut in firm orders, but were hurt by the serials and the other departments that were flip-flopped. So we, we tried to make the pain, you know, spread evenly, and we tried to take as much into consideration as we could, but at the end of the day, we only have so many staff members and so much staff time. There's only so much analysis that we could do. This, this took me a full year. Um, I started in October, late October of 2013. Yes, we're in 15 now. 13, and I finished up the bulk of my work around April of 2014, but my we did not actually have a final list of resources um, to actually say cut um, or stop until what? October of last year? Well, uh, basically, uh, the assistant dean of collection management basically had to say, no more, this is final, because you need at least a couple of months break before we get into the next round right. of cuts. But right. we had so much going back and forth and negotiating with, with faculty and liaisons that it was a, a long, drawn-out process. That's right. We had a question about um, your usage. Um, so, had you noticed any particular subject area that was not being used um, more than other subject areas? Well, I mean, every subject area had its um, um, variations. Uh, I cannot tell you right off the top of my head um, what those would be. And we're also changing the way we're looking at um, resources by subject. We're doing a much more interdisciplinary where uh, certain resources could be um, included in more, one or more uh, subjects. Uh, so previously, the funds is the traditional way where one resource is under one subject or you have this big interdisciplinary pot. Um, but um, now we're taking a much more interdisciplinary look um, or maybe even multidisciplinary might be a better uh, were to use um, so that um, the resources could be in more, more than one pot, more than one subject. So that'll be interesting to look at um, the difference. But no, I can't tell you right off. Yes, there were differences. I can't tell you what they were. Um, as a follow-up question, um, someone asked how your looking at the multidisciplinary titles, how you're identifying those titles? Uh, that's a whole other session. <laughs> um, basically, it boils down to using um, um, essentially the conspectus subject ranges um, so that certain ranges um, are assigned to one or more collections, call number ranges, Library uh, Congress classification call numbers. And so, um, any resource that has a call number is, could be, is assigned to a range, and then that range could be assigned to more than one or more collections. Um, so um, that's, that's a big project, and I'm only just now getting to the point where I can um, talk to others about it, and it, it would take a whole other session. <laughs> Um, 
All right, well, I think um, if there aren't any more questions, I think that's all the time that we have for today. Um, thank you very much, Todd and Karen, um, for sharing your experiences with us. And just thank a reminder you. to everyone that we'll uh, be sending out a link to the recording of the webinar and a copy of the Q&A and the slides um, briefly, shortly after the webinar. Um, thank you all for joining us today, and we hope to see you again at our next continuing education event. Thank you all.